Suzanne Boschma is a senior research scientist with the New South Wales DPI based in Tamworth. And uh, Suze was with us last year talking tropical pastures. Over the last 15 years, Suze's work has been based on tropical pastures, understanding how to utilise them in grazing systems in northern New South Wales. She's currently leading a project which is investigating the role of tropical grass pastures in southern New South Wales. And given our last three years of wet, very wet summers, where did you go? Around timey. Um, yeah, there could be a good, um, a good opportunity for a portion of um, tropical grass pastures in our southern area. But I'm sure Sue's going to tell us all about it. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. All right, uh, thank you very much to the Riverina LLS for the opportunity to come and speak with you uh, today. I certainly do appreciate it. The, um, so, I guess we've been working on tropical pastures down here in southern New South Wales now for about five years as part of the Livestock Productivity Partnership. Um, it's a program which is funded by New South Wales DPI and Meat and Livestock Australia Donor Company. And um, we've, with the change in seasons and our rainfall events, we, we saw that there was an opportunity for tropical pastures to come further south than what they have traditionally been. When we, when we first started, uh, made some inquiries at the beginning of the project. Is this because I'm short? Point that to them. <laughs> Thank you. Was that you or me? Okay. All right, we'll see how we go. I might be nodding at you lots. All right, so um, four years ago when we were looking, we wanted to come down and talk to producers down in this part of the world to find out um, what you thought about tropical pastures, whether you saw there was an opportunity, what you saw as being their potential benefits, and where we should be focusing our resources to, to address some of those issues for you. And um, there was interest in central New South Wales, but as we, when we started talking to agronomists down here in southern New South Wales, we were told there was no fit, there is no interest, and effectively, please go back to northern New South Wales. So um, last year, I was lucky enough to be invited to come along to, um, to, this, to this forum, to, to the pasture update. Um, thank you, Riverina LLS. And um, basically got to have a bit of a chat to you about tropical pastures and what we were doing. And I was really quite excited when I went back to my seat after giving my presentation, and here was a, a text saying, I've actually been sowing tropical pastures for a few years now, and I think, I think they're pretty cool. Well, not, those are my words, not his. Um, and it's really just, that was really quite a light bulb moment for me, that there is interest here. And since then, since then, um, I've actually made contact with a range of different producers, Okay, it says next. <laughs> I was pushing the wrong button, there you go. Um, there's, there's actually quite a few producers down here which have actually been playing with, with tropical pastures. There is a, quite a bit of interest and there are agronomists that are also ready to have clients that are interested and are really and ready to support producers um, who want to have a play with these species. So what I want to do today is basically just, um, we're coming close, we, we're nearing the end of our project, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity, or just to give you a rundown on some of the work that we have been doing um, down in this part of the world. All right, so right back at the very beginning, we just had a bit of a look at where might these tropical pastures grow. So this is digigrass, and um, this is just some modeling, looking at temperature and rainfall about where they might grow. And you can see there's actually quite a big chunk of that uh, southeast Australia where these species, or this is digit, where digit could potentially grow. So on the inline, inland, it's, it's certainly restricted by, um, by high temperatures and, and more rainfall. Um, and then when you go up onto that high altitude, then it's the cold temperatures. And when you have a look at the Wagga rainfall, it's pretty variable, but it's, it's pretty flat line. It hasn't really, there's a slight decrease but basically, you're, you're getting you're around your 600 millimetres um, a year, plus or minus lots, but 600. 
When you actually break that down into the six months for your cool season, so from May to October, you know, they are the blue dots. And then um, the warm season over that summer period from say November to April, they're the red dots. If you have a look at that long term, um, you can actually see that those lines are starting to converge. Your actual winter rainfall as a proportion of your total is actually declining while your, um, your summer rainfall is actually increasing. And this is what we've been hearing from a range of different producers at different workshops and field days that we've been attending, is that producers are noticing this. So this is where tropical pastures fit. If you're getting more and more rainfall actually occurring over those summer months of the year, what species have you got in your system that can utilise that? And that's where tropical pastures can fit. They're actually highly responsive to that. You use it or lose it, and they can supply green feed for you over that summer. Now we did some modelling having a look at a range of different pasture types. So here um, we've got this over two different time periods. These, the solid lines are for the 1960 to 1990 period. So the blue line is, um, is ryegrass, ryegrass clover, so just an annual, annual winter. And you'll see we've got that peak peak in spring. Again, if you've got loosened rye clover, there's a bit of activity over that summer period. But again, you've got yet that peak in your spring. Now, when you actually look at having a tropical, a tropical clover or a tropical grass with your rye clover, that's the, the yellow and the green ones, you're actually getting that response, that good response to your summer rainfall. As well as um, that with the winter species um, in that mix, actually also giving you that increase over that winter period. Sorry, uh, in spring. Now, if we have a look, compare that to what's, what the last 30 years were like, so from 1991 to, 200, to 2021, the dotted lines, um, you'll see that anything where you've actually got that spring production, it has the growth rates have dropped and they've also happening earlier in that growing season. So you, you, you're shortening, you're actually getting a shortening of that growth of the growth season. In contrast, where you've had the tropical grass in the mix, it's actually, it's also gone from say, what are we, around an April back to about March, but we're actually getting, um, it's actually getting higher, you're actually getting higher growth rates. So this is where, where the tropicals potentially are fitting. We did some modelling to have a look at um, what sort of establishment we might be able to get. So just to orientate you, across the bottom we've got, um, we, we hypothetically sowed in spring and then using historical rainfall we were able to identify when that first, the first emergence event would happen. Now one of the things with tropicals and the way they sort of differ from, um, from temperate pastures is that you might get multiple rainfall events and you'll have emergence at each of those. While with your temperate pastures, you probably find you get you know, 90, you know, 80, 90% of your seed all comes up in one rainfall event. That's not what happens in tropicals. So here, you, um, Kondo, um, we've got the majority of, or the first emergent event tended to occur around that November, January. Just adding now some other sites, um, looking at Wagga and Leeton, it's, it's a bit of a, it's, a, it's flat. So the numbers were, were low but there was no particular month where you were actually going to get um, increased establishment. But we thought those numbers were, were not very good, so we actually then had a tweak with the, the, um, the soil type, and we found that but just by increasing that water holding capacity, just that little tiny bit, we can actually change, um, using leaton rainfall data, we could actually change it from being a really low likelihood of um, establishment through to really quite significant. The other thing we found is that by adding cover, so if you're just sowing into just bare dirt, no ground cover, um, it's the, the soil surface is very hot, it dries very, very quickly. But if you've actually got some ground cover provided by a, um, an oat stubble or something similar, um, you, that, that helps hold that soil moisture and you can get um, emergence earlier. So a, lo a smaller rainfall event can be sufficient to bring up your pasture. Now we did some work looking at um, seedling establishment and survival. So in this we looked at sowing at three different times of the year. So um, they were sown in, I think it was October, December and March. So when you sowed in spring and autumn, we actually had our highest emergence. Um, 
But the winter survival was, was also extremely variable, varied with species and, and also when you sowed. So if you sowed later, we actually had lower seedling survival. Stored soil moisture was really important. So it comes down to prior planning and preparation. Where we had good stored soil moisture sowing in spring, um, it was essential for survival. So while you have a rainfall event is important for getting your seedlings out of the ground, it was actually that stored soil moisture that, that was responsible for the persistence. And fitting in with what Richard Hayes was talking about um, before lunch, he was talking about some of the legacy. If, you don't, if it's not good in that, first, in that first year, then the past just sort of limps on and takes a while to get going. Um, exactly the same with the tropicals where you actually had a strong pasture um, and, and good seedling uh, recruitment, that there was a legacy effect of that, even 18 months after the pasture was sown. We had a look at sowing. So when on earth are you going to sow these? Down here, you've got declining, your, your rainfall becomes more variable and less, summer, less likelihood of summer rainfall, it, it becomes less predictable just as your soil temperature is going up and we're wanting to sow. So what's, what is the sowing window? So we had a look, um, we sowed a range of four different grasses at five sites. Now across the bottom here, I've got soil temperature um, and it is in a warming soil. So from spring, so increasing during the spring, the bold line is, is about the maximum, so over that summer period, and then it declines over that autumn period. So we've got um, emergence proportion of, of the maximum. Now what I've got here is we were able to determine by, by plotting all, all, the, all the data we had from the five sites, we've, um, we were able to determine that the, the soil temperature, the optimum soil temperature or the minimum soil temperature rather, um, for sowing some of these species um, is, um, it varies with species. But um, I guess you know, we talk about 16 being the case for sorghum and that's probably a pretty good rule of thumb for, um, for tropical for the tropical grasses as well. Rhodes grass can go a little bit earlier, at, say at 14 degrees, while the panic, so that's uh, like the Gatton panic type and Bambatsi panic, they actually like warmer soils. Now, the, um, I've, while I've got a spring like that, that whole window, the spring through to the autumn, the suggestion is to go earlier in that sowing window because that then you're getting, you're maximising the number of opportunities to be able to get a rainfall event to get good emergence of your pasture. So a temperature is fine, so when is that actually for this part of the world? Um, having a look at, um, at the long-term uh, data um, around Wagga, we're sort of talking about that window to November to March, um, and Yenko, so from about late October. We've, we've had a sown a range of these different species in a, a number of different sites across the state. Um, this is some data for Wagga. This experiment is only a couple of years old, so it's still very, very new, and, um, and it's sort of with some reluctance that I've actually got it up here. So this is certainly not a species recommendation. I think one of the other speakers has actually commented um, that you need, you know, a perennial pasture is about the long term. It's not after two or three years. It's more like, you know, after five years and what's still standing then. So here, um, Rhodes grasses um, have done really, really well, which is pretty standard for those sort of species. Um, they, they do tend to look pretty, look good in the first few years, um, but my experience is that they tend to fall out. But, um, but you've actually got your Premier Digit, your Bambatsi Panic and Gatton Panics, um, they're all doing, doing quite well um, there as well. Um, here at Cowra, actually I didn't explain what even the axes mean. So the plant frequency is actually looking at persistence while um, up on the, the y-axis we're looking at dry matter production. So anything which is up in that top right-hand corner has done well. Um, it's, it's got a good frequency, so it's covering a lot of ground or many, lots of plants, and um, it also has good productivity. Now this is um, data for Cowra. Now these grasses, the tropical grasses, were sown in spring 2018. They tried to put the grasses in the following year, um, the drought beat them, so the grasses were sown the, sown the following year. So they were sown 18 months after, um, after the, the tropicals. So um, not surprising, the temperates, uh, we're not quite comparing apples and apples here with the different 
such a, a huge difference between the sowing times. But not surprising, the temperates are up in that top right hand corner. But what's interesting though is that we've actually got a range of temperates, sorry, a range of tropicals which are, which are you know, up there as well, which, um, which, is, which is promising. Uh, this is also data from Cara. They actually measured, um, or they calculated the sowing, uh, sorry, the, the, the growth rates um, after the break of the drought um, for a couple of the, um, couple of the, the harvests before um, the cool set in. And um, you see, we've actually got a group of species here which, um, which you know, we're, we're looking at some pretty good growth rates there, up, you know, up over 100, 100 kilos per hectare per day. They're pretty high growth rates. So that's the sort of response you can get from these type of species. And just as a bit of a comparison, lucerne, which can be a bit of a beast and be quick, um, quick out of the um, um, quick starter as well, um, it, it, you know, it, at this particular time of year, it, um, the grasses were, the tropical grasses were beating it hands down. Now mineral content, um, so we've been collecting samples for uh, for equality analysis and also having a look at minerals just to see whether there's anything else that's restricting this. Um, Gordon actually had a look at some of these data and um, if there's any questions, I'm sure Gordy will be uh, more than happy to answer them for me. The, um, so basically the, um, the, the sodium was a bit low, which is interesting listening to, uh, to Gordy's presentation um, this afternoon. Um, phosphorus is also a bit low on these species, uh, and so therefore, you know, we've got then the calcium phosphorus ratio and also the, the calcium sodium ratios, you know, a bit out of kilter. Now, Gordy's the best person to be able to answer questions about the consequences on that, but um, just, uh, just an agronomist uh, interpretation of what, from what Gordy was talking about, then maybe we've actually got a slight restriction in, um, on intake and therefore animal production if we have actually got some of these things are limiting, for example, the salt. Okay, so Gordy actually recommended just based on, on this um, snapshot of, of some of our data um, was that adding salt would be particularly helpful. Um, although if it was actually a mixed pasture and you had rhodes grass in there, it's actually got good sodium, so um, it probably wouldn't be as required. Um, and he also suggested that adding um, a, a, a phosphorus leak would actually also be a benefit. Now, um, I think it was um, Nigel commented that he actually has a supplement that goes around um, with his stock, and, and this produces up in the, in the northern New South Wales, which actually do the same thing. And, and the, the animals just help themselves when they, when they have a bit of a need and find that's, um, that seems to work best. Now one of the biggest limitations or one of the concerns producers have about, um, about tropical pastures is their quality. They have a reputation for being really horrible and, you know, and, and they're not loosened. And, you know, but they grow at a different time of year to your phalaris pastures. So I think, you know, we just need to be yeah, they're not as bad as, as what you might actually think. So here, um, now the NDF is pretty low. I think uh, looking at Lindsay's uh, information this morning, I think he had red cells for anything that had an NDF over 30. You see our minimum here for NDF was actually 44. So, you know, our, our fibre content is actually, is really high. But, um, but, you know, our crude protein, is okay. Our ME for some of the species is okay, and it varies depending on the time of year and, and your situation. Now, the, um, the March 2020 was immediately after the drought, and that's why those numbers look particularly good. It's not always like this. Um, these are just blips in the map. Just, yeah, it's, it's highly variable. But with those sort of numbers, you can be looking at, you know, one to greater than one kilo per hectare per head per day um, um, uh, for livestock. Now, the other thing to remember with this is that um, when people collect samples for, um, for, 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 for analysis of tropical pastures, and it's probably the same for all pastures, we run along and we grab big handfuls. And I find boys tend to take bigger handfuls than what girls do. And then you end up with green, dead, leaf, stem, and, and all the rest of it. And we send that off. And, and yeah, with the tropical, because on any one plant, you can have a vegetative tiller through to a reproductive tiller. 
unlike Phalaris or you know some of the other, a lot of the other temperates, because they don't have that, because tropicals don't have a synchronous flowering. When you actually just go and take a grab sample, you could be getting anything from vegetative through to reproductive. And so I think part of the reason why our samples, our lab numbers never reflect or don't seem to reflect the actual animal production we see in the paddock is partly because what we're sampling is not what the animal is eating. So we know that they select, they can be very selective, they select green over dead. We know they select leaf, they select leaf over stem. Can you put me back please? They collect leaf over stem. The other thing they also um, they do is they will select a new leaf over an old leaf. And they also select leaf tip over, over um, yeah, they will start at the tip of the leaf, which has got the highest quality, and then work their way down the leaf. And I have a really nice picture. I'm sorry I stuffed it up, guys. Um, I, have, I have a picture where you, where I've actually got this plant, which has been grazed by sheep, and they've actually just nipped the tip of every single leaf. Thank you. They've nipped the, leaf, the, the tip of every single leaf. So I think the samples that we tend to collect and send in for analysis are not necessarily representative of what the, uh, what the animal is actually selecting. So I think um, we just need to be mindful of that when we collect samples in the future. Okay, legumes. Um, one, another concern that people have, have of, of tropicals is, is, you know, I don't really want to tie up a paddock um, to something that's only going to grow for a few months of the year. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to need a temperate to go with it. I'm going to need a temperate legume. So um, we've had some learnings on this front. Um, the first one is probably we want to establish your grass first. Uh, so adapted legumes. If you've got a legume that works really well on your soil type, then that's the legume you should be, should be using. Um, grasses don't survive. These tropical grasses don't survive when they're, some, when they're, when they're absolutely smothered. So the, the 2020 season, um, we had four experiments in, two of them, two of them were, were smothered and the grasses died. So in those years, you actually need to be able to manage for the weak link, which is the tropical grass, and, um, and remove that. So either through high stocking numbers or, or possibly bale it. Uh, now, and, and you also, in order to have some space to be able for that legume to come up in, similar to what Rowan was talking about, um, you want to be able to graze your pasture to actually open, open up that space, provide space for the legume to come through, but leave sufficient on your grass in order for it not to be smothered um, by the legume. Um, we've also done some work on ensiling. So, you know, during times of year when, when you've got a lot of growth, you may, not, you may not be able to utilise it. If you wanted to bale it for hay or even in silent, you could do so. Um, so this is work that we've done more for, for northern New South Wales, but it's certainly applicable for down here. Um, if you're going to in silent, make sure that you choose vegetative pastures, not reproductive ones. Um, the low water soluble carbohydrate content of these pastures is an issue when it comes to ensiling. So you need a rapid wilt, and I recommend aiming for around 35% um, dry matter. To improve fermentation, um, we actually recommend that you actually add a bacterial inoculant to it, and we tried two. I'm certainly not recommending these over anything else, but um, we tried two, and, and both did a great job. How were these pastures being utilised? So um, it's, yeah, talking to producers, um, visiting producers and, and the like, um, we've seen that, that one of the, the fits for these pastures is to actually provide some ground cover and have a competitive pasture against some of your, your uh, summer weed issues, for example, silver leaf nightshade. Um, speaking to a produce, uh, producer here, was actually weaning his, um, weaning his um, Angus calves he put them, normally he would just wean them and put them onto a dry pasture with some pellets. Um, he'd be gaining around half a kilo. Uh, but uh, this year he put it onto a digit pasture and he, um, he was gaining 0.8 of a kilo just by putting them onto a green pasture. And I guess where they, they also fit is this actually, having a tropical pasture in your system will actually allow you to be able to, um, to rest your temperate pasture for that little bit longer 
let it get up, get a bit more leaf on it, let it start to store some carbohydrate, uh, do all the things it needs to do for long-term persistence um, because you're grazing that tropical. Now, here's a, a bit of a plug. Um, we've, um, we were lucky enough to be invited to the Holbrook um, Landcare Network um, field day that they had um, looking at tropicals uh, back in April this year. Um, the, so the Holbrook Landcare Network have a, a producer demonstration site project which is um, in collaboration or funded um, by Meat and Livestock Australia. I think it's a five-year project. Um, they're looking at a range of different species, temperate and tropical, to be able to, to see what grows over that summer period to get to utilise some of that summer rainfall. Tropicals is, are one, is a group of species that they are interested in. Um, we had a field day um, down at Henty. It was really well attended. There were producers there that had been playing with tropicals um, for a while, so there was some really some excellent suggestions and, um, and conversations and discussions about tropical pastures. So if you are interested in tropical pastures, um, if you would, um, yeah, if you'd like to, to get hook up with a group of people, like-minded people about these species, um, please contact the Holbrook Landcare Network. There's actually two people here, Emma and Nick. Can you put your hands up for me, please? So I've got two Holbrook people here. If you would, I don't have them, they came by themselves. Um, but they, um, but um, please go and, go and see them if you are interested in this because um, they're both involved in this project. And uh, yeah, look, it, it's really nice to, for like minds to be able to get together, so producers and agronomists. Uh, this work, um, while I get the opportunity to stand and uh, talk about some of the work we've been doing, it's actually, I'm actually a small part, one person in a very large team. So I'd like to thank the, uh, the DPI team who have been involved in this, and that's everything from scientists, technicians, through to our extension team. Um, and as I said before, this project uh, was funded by DPI and Meat and Livestock Australia donor company, and it is part of the Livestock Productivity Partnership. Thank you. Great, thank you, Suze. Um, we might just ask Rowan and Suze and who was the other one? Gordon, they might just.